Disturbingly Natural World of Patricia Piccinini. Hybridity is the production of combining two or more distinct elements. It is simply a mixture. This action of blending two elements to create one is how our planet came to be so naturally diverse. Humanity has always taken cues from the natural world, and as such, we strive to achieve the new. We often equate this quest for the new as an act of improvement. Creating something from pre-existing components is how we humans tend to progress culturally and increasingly physically. In the study of science, these combinations can be found in areas like novel strains of viruses, new theories in physics and mathematics based off of old understandings, and cross-pollination and cross-breeding between species. Hybridity in art is just as common through practices like blending old techniques with new methods, cross-cultural influencing, and trans-global exchanges in aesthetics, ideas, and methodologies. Art has been a cultural tool for instruction and reflection since the time of our cave-dwelling ancestors. The study of art is a way to understand the values, politics, and technologies of past times and other cultures. The understanding of art in this way is not relegated to historical use alone. Artists are using their work to help frame moral and philosophical questions that we can use to understand how our future might look and what paths we should or should not take. Patricia Piccinini is one of a growing number of artists that is tackling the increasingly relevant topic of biotechnology. Specifically, Piccinini uses the medium of sculpture to provoke debate on the ethics of genetic engineering for human use, the consumer's value of aesthetics and science, and the growing potential for technology to become one with nature. In this presentation, I will give a visual analysis of three of her sculptures and pose questions that they present. In an article written on Piccinini's sculpture, The Young Family, Elizabeth Finkel recalls how disconcerting she initially found her art. The young family rose to fame in the early 2000s alongside the hot button issue of stem cell research. At first, she felt that the sculpture might only cause harm to a topic that was already receiving a lot of outrage from the mass populace. With the possibilities that stem cells provided toward improved human life, such as treatment for Parkinson's disease or treating spinal cord injuries, came the fears that usually accompany such a large leap in science or technology. One of the fears present at the time was the possible creation of animal and human hybrids, or chimeras, for the purpose of organ harvesting. Piccinini's The Young Family depicts exactly this sort of scenario. So, in another interview provided for a 2007 solo exhibition, the artist expressed her desire for the sculpture to be interpreted from a layman's point of view. Quote, What I love is when people argue over what the work is trying to say and they begin the process of examining the issues from a number of perspectives. I love it when people realize that all this stuff is actually about our lives today." End quote. By considering the scene without the obvious moral questions raised by breeding life for organ harvesting, the audience can consider a variety of existential scenarios as our genetic futures continue to expand. In the sculpture, we are presented with a prone nude figure. The form is that of a bovine creature with long ears, protruding snout, thick neck, and a strange hunched torso. The creature appears to be a quadruped or an animal that walks on four limbs. At the same time, the flesh clearly looks like that of Homo sapiens, down to the pronounced pores on the face. There's a smattering of hair on the top of its head and covering the forearms. Its humanoid hands, though oversized, are resting comfortably under the face in a state of relaxed dreaminess. The figure's feet seem to have fingers in the place of toes, much like one would find on apes. These finger toes are curled under in a subtle demonstration of tension as a result of the suckling young. The breastfeeding figure is presumably female with her rows of nipples, but even this presumption is called into question as we have difficulty relating the hybrid to known categories. The presumed mother lies on her side on a soft table-like structure. The odd pairing of the white leather and the futuristic shape of the furniture 
makes it unclear whether it is intended to be interpreted as a bed or a table. Instead, it represents both. The natural world of the bed, where one would expect to find a mother with her newborns, as well as the more clinical, white, laboratory world of an operating table, where one would expect to find a genetic biological production. The viewer is confronted with their own judgments of human superiority while looking at the sentient, dreamy expression on the mother's face. The playful child smiling on its back and holding its toes challenges the solidity of human exceptionalism. The viewer wonders what it means to be human. Is it our physical form? Our sentience? Are we so different from the life forms with whom we share this planet? How far would we go to preserve the idea that the life of a human has more value than another species? The benevolent facial expressions and the vulnerable positions of mother and children become relatable to the viewer, but might have first inspired disgust begins to soften as the audience finds more of the human and the hybrids before them. This growing acceptance of the new life forms allows the viewer to consider more empathetic purposes these creatures could have in our society. How else might they fit in? In the welcome guest, Puccinini finds a more aesthetic place for these creatures to inhabit. Though initially even more unsettling than the young family, there is a whimsical nature to this scene not found in the sterile dystopia of the former. Here we are presented with a child and creature standing on a bed together, facing one another with hands clasped. The hybrid is slightly taller than the girl and has a near bald head with faint traces of hair, reminiscent of the head of a young child. This creature is enough to cause an immediate unsettled reaction as it is uncomfortable to see an alien entity approaching a small child. However, Pichinini deftly mitigates the fight flight or freeze response triggered by the appear appearance of danger through coupling this humanoid chimera with the elongated claws of a sloth. Though slightly taller than the girl, it seems somehow more delicate as its standing position looks precarious. The creature's claws begin to curl around the small human, but any alarm becomes assuaged as the connection to the slow-moving, gentle mammal is made. This illusion is a clever way to make the viewer pause and consider what is being presented while creating a calming juxtaposition. Is it an intruder or a friendly dream? At the head of the bed rests a peacock, a symbol of the elite and of aestheticism found in nature. The extravagant tail of the bird prevents the utilitarian movement of flight and instead functions solely as a symbol of beauty. Likewise, the chimera's long claws made for climbing hard surfaces serve no visible purpose in this soft environment. Where the figures in the young family were bred to be destroyed for human use, in the welcome guest we see a chimeric life that has been created for human pleasure. Art historian Alexander Albaro has argued that there is a modern push for beauty to function merely for its own sake, untampered by political, social, or cultural meaning. Where the affluent once displayed their wealth through ownership of exotic birds, might they also do the same with designer pets? This idea raises its own issues in the ongoing debate over the ethics of transgenic beings. For, from using genetics to create glow-in-the-dark rabbits, to bio-artists cultivating life forms for the express purpose of display, to philosophical debates over who has the rights to utilize genetic engineering is growing ever more relevant to the techno nature of the world today. What happens when we begin creating new forms of life specifically for the purpose of product placement and advertising? Glowfish are a trademark brand of live fish that have been genetically altered for bioluminescence. As a result, glowfish have achieved the status of the first biotech pet. With powerful gene editing technology at our disposal, we have already begun to create life for the purpose of profit. Could designer creatures become the norm? How would we define these new rules of ownership to ensure against new forms of enslavement? After having approached transgenesis from the perspective of Homo sapiens in the previous two works, 
Piccinini envisions life from the point of view of some of its creations. The couple shows a female and male humanoid embracing in a bed. The figures appear to be nude and are cuddled together under a white sheet. The male is curled on his side with his face resting on the female's shoulder. His eyes are closed in a state of rest while the female looks contentedly upward. Her paw presses lightly on his cheek as the couple rests in a soft moment of intimate embrace. The lovers are more human in appearance than the previous figures, but they still have obvious elements that place them as the other. They have elongated faces that are highlighted in the dreamy positioning of the female and the loving nuzzle of the male. Their hands are more like paws as they are used to highlight the entwinement of the pair's feet and the tenderness of their embrace. Here the viewer is presented with love, love that does not require a human gaze to exist. The white bed and linens contrast to the white medical table of the young family, where the mother and children were contained in a human controlled space. Here, the white bed and linens are personal and safe for these inhabitants. These two are outsiders and young lovers. They are relatable on every level except appearance. Functioning together naturally in an environment not controlled by creators gives the pair the aura of free will, not seen in the previous two sculptures. In her statement on the couple, the artist writes, quote, they may feel alone, but they are young and a couple. And in that sense, they represent the potential life energy of youth. They carry the possibility of reproduction and the possibility for a future outside of our control. Even if their origin is within human control, their destiny is in their own hands." End quote. The couple creates a natural continuation from one stage of transgenic life to the next, one that naturalizes technology and creates something truly novel. It becomes easy to envision a world where we, where we might be drinking coffee, working with, or even having relationships with these genetic chimeras. It's the next phase of human evolution man-made. As we continue to struggle with discrimination and hatred within our own species, should we create new forms of life before resolving our existing destructive biases? Piccinini sculptures pose increasingly relevant questions as we enter a future where identity politics become less about race, gender, or religion, but rather about the human versus the non-human. As the idea of human exceptionalism becomes more invalidated, the ethics of genetic engineering for human purposes, whether medicinal or commercial, become murkier. While we struggle to meet equitable terms for the life that already inhabits this planet, do we have the moral right to support transgenic experimentation? With these new capabilities, who gets to determine how we should progress? If we continue to cross genetics, perhaps we might also allow the crossing of science and art. Mira Sethi and Adam Brickle propose in their essay, Making Stories Visible, the Task for Bioethics Commissions, that DNA is a language and the writing of it is akin to literature. If access to DNA construction is limited, will we miss out on the next great masterpiece? As proposed in their article, quote, life like freedom of expression, the freedom to create new forms of life should be a fundamental right, end quote. Whether artists will have continued access to transgenic technology remains to be seen. The potential for art to play a powerful role in shaping how that technology is used is much clearer.